Welcome to this week's edition of the St. Paul Podcast. I'm Katie Warren, one of the pastors here at St. Paul Lutheran Church, located in the heart of Davenport, Iowa. Right here, each week, you can hear a message to inspire your walk with God and hear beautiful music to fill your life. Let this podcast be your occasion to contemplate some of the deepest things in life, just as I hope it helps faith come alive for you. Mac Mullins, one of the pastors here at St. Paul. I'm so glad you found this podcast today, and I hope these words of scripture and a reflection of hope bring you peace and comfort as you listen. I don't know if you've ever worked with kids who aren't your own, but there's a pattern I've noticed over the years. It doesn't matter if it's summer camp, vacation Bible school, confirmation, youth group, or service trip, the same thing always happens. When the kids first arrive, most of them are shy and guarded. They've had a long day at school socializing. There's a number of people they don't know. They're getting to an age where it isn't very cool to be excited to see their pastor or be at church. The beginnings of these gatherings, they tend to be subdued and reserved. But as more kids start to arrive, especially as more friends walk through the doors, each kid comes to life just a little bit at a time shared whispers while friends sit next to one another, giggles across a table at an inside joke. Eventually, hugs and play start to make an appearance. By the end of the day, end of the night, at the end of the trip, the kids that walked through those doors aren't the same kids saying goodbye to me. They're wide open, personality and delight on full display, laughing and singing and joking in public, no longer just in private. Being around their friends and peers plays a huge part of this, but I also wonder if this slow shift from closed off to wide open is because they slowly become grounded in a sense of love. 
In these groups, they aren't just playing games. They've also found a place where they can be themselves and not be judged or scolded. They can be free and genuine because their friends, their teachers, their counselors, their mentors are all pouring love into each child. And the child is a changed person because of that. The letter to the Ephesians includes a prayer, which I'm about to read, that expresses the same hope for each one of us, that every human being comes to be rooted and grounded in the love that Jesus Christ has for the world. It's a hope that will be transformed and strengthened in ourselves and for the sake of other people. Listen now to these words, a prayer of desire from the end of the third chapter of Ephesians. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom all peoples in earth and on heaven take their name. I pray that according to the riches of God's glory, you all may be granted strength in your inner being with power through the Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know Christ's love which surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled up in all the goodness of God. Now glory be to the Father, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, and glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. As this prayer settles into us, here are some of my thoughts on how the love of Jesus might take root in our own inner beings. I wonder if you've noticed that the things you desire, the things that you really want, have changed as your life goes on. I imagine for many of us, the thing we most desired at six o'clock this morning was probably a cup of coffee, or maybe three if you're me. But really, in, in your 20s and in your 30s, you might desire two or three more hours in the day just so you can finish all of the things you want to get done. When you're 65, maybe you're counting down those days, those last days until retirement so you have more time for yourself, for your spouse, for your family. After a long day playing in the sun, working in the yard, maybe running seven miles all around downtown, maybe the only thing in the world you want is a cup of water and a scoop of Whitey's. When I was 10 years old, the thing every kid desired, myself included, was a Game Boy Advanced. And in 2002, what made this Game Boy so advanced was this special new technology. It had a built-in light in the screen. Real groundbreaking stuff. <laughs> All year, I told my parents how badly I wanted this toy, how badly I desired it. It was the only thing I included in my letter to Santa Claus that year. And when Christmas came, I ran downstairs and I saw all of the presents under the tree, but they all seemed to be suspiciously too large for a tiny little handheld device. After the obligatory socks and the sweaters and the stocking stuffers, it was time for the first big present, a gift from my aunt in California. Now she knew that I love music. I had just started to learn how to sing. I was learning how to play instruments. So naturally, the only thing in the world a musical 10-year-old would want for Christmas is a ukulele. <laughs> Not quite a Game Boy. And no, I never learned how to play it. The other big gift sitting under that tree was from my grandmother, a woman with a reputation questionable in gift giving. A quick shake of the box revealed a lot of rattling, a lot of small pieces rolling around inside. Then a quick rip of the paper revealed not that coveted Game Boy, but the board game Clue. The same board game I had had since I was five. 
the same board game my aunt had gotten me for my birthday nine months prior. <laughs> like any other 10-year-old filled to the brim with disappointment, with anger and resentment and feeling unseen and misunderstood, the waterworks began and the rest of Christmas was spent by my mother trying to console a disappointed little boy. But what I failed to see, what my personal desires had clouded from my view, was the love that my aunt and my grandmother had shown for me. They knew that I loved music. They knew that I loved to spend time with family playing board games. And from the love they had for me, they tried to fill my desires based on who they knew me to be. Their love guided their choices, and my desire, which was so focused on only loving myself, failed to notice. Who and what we desire is at the very heart of our reading from Ephesians this morning. In fact, this prayer that sits at the end of chapter 3, it has a desire for us. It's a hope and a yearning that we might focus our own desires towards one particular place, to be rooted in the fullness of God. The author of Ephesians lays out what this change in our hearts is going to look like. It begins all the way at the beginning. Whether that beginning is the beginning of humanity or the moment of each of our births, God is there. It is God who gives us our name. Whether that name is human or Adam or Emily or Mac, we receive our name from the one person who truly knows us intimately and who remains with us until the end, not just the end of our earthly life, but till the end of time. But God's intimate knowledge of who we are and God's naming of us, that's not quite enough to change our desires. When left to their own devices, our hearts, our desires, they tend to remain like little 10-year-old Mac, focused on the material, focused on myself, focused on my wants, focused on my immediate gratification. So we need someone to come and help us, someone to give us courage and assurance that someone is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit enters into our inner being, our inner hearts, to give us strength and perseverance in letting go of selfish ambition and trusting that our needs will be met even if our wants might not be. It's this moment that is the beginning of being rooted and grounded in Christ. When we receive that Holy Spirit into our hearts, the tendrils of love begin to spread out. The same love that Jesus has for us, the love he showed in his ministry on earth, the love he shows us on the cross, that love begins to settle deep within us. It takes root, and those roots only continue to grow deeper. As they grow, we come to know Christ and his love more and more, and we might be tempted to think that that's the point, that the end goal of faith, of religion, of Christianity, is to simply know that Christ loves us and that we show that love back to Christ. But who Christ Jesus is and what Jesus has for all the things and the love that Jesus has for all things isn't something we can ever fully understand. We strive for it. We aim for it. But we'll never quite get there. It's a kind of love that is too vast. It reaches past the frontiers of our imaginations. But we go for it anyways. We love anyways. We seek the love of Jesus anyways, even if we know we'll never reach its end. This knowledge of love, less of a head knowledge, more of a heart knowledge, it becomes the fertilizer for those roots. We'll water, we'll spend our lives pruning, we'll repot, we'll tend to that love. But the Spirit doesn't give us the strength of love just for ourselves. 
God doesn't ground our lives in Christ just for our own comfort. I think it's actually the exact opposite. God leads us to this fullness of love purposely so that we can empty ourselves. Empty ourselves for God and empty ourselves for other people. You know, we don't make a pitcher of lemonade just to stare at it. We drink it. We're filled with love because we are meant to share love as deeply as Jesus does. We become the living, breathing, walking love of God within our world. Jesus even takes a moment to show us what this love can look like in reality. In our story from today's gospel in John, we so often focus on that miracle, the act in the story of feeding those 5,000, how Jesus could take five loaves of bread and two fish and feed that multitude. We often gloss over and miss the little boy in the story. It's the little boy who's, excuse me, journeyed with the crowd and has brought with him the loaves and the fish. You don't know why he brought them. Maybe it's the snack for his family and it's his job to carry it around. He could have brought them to sell them for some meager change to help his family. Instead, unbeknownst to him, that little food that he had brought that morning was used by Jesus to feed thousands. We're so impressed by the miracle itself that sometimes we miss the abundance of God's power and love working through a small child. Imagine if this was our desire for ourselves. What kind of life would each of us live? What kind of life would this community have if we desired to be filled with Christ's love and God's abundance? It would pour out of us to change the world around us. We can run wild imagining all of the possibilities, And the good news is there is an and we can imagine and we don't have to imagine because God's already begun that work of love through us. The strength of the Spirit is already rooted and alive with us when we care for one another, when we're sick and in need. When we move to a new town, we're there with a casserole and some cookies for our desire to provide affordable housing in the city for our decades-long work mentoring, loving, and feeding the children and families at Madison Elementary. The love of Christ is real, and you can see it. And we can still be excited to imagine more, to imagine new possibilities as our lives change, as our community changes and grows. What we come up with, what we envision for our life together, might make us a little nervous, might even make us a little bit afraid. It's the unknown. It can do that. But if what the author of Ephesians says is true, that we truly are every day being rooted and grounded in Jesus, and I think it is true, then that anxiety is tempered. It's tempered with excitement, tempered with joy, tempered with hope that God's promise of redemption and inclusion is not just for an elect few, but for the entire world, and that it's given for us, too. Maybe our Christmas lists to Santa do change every year. I think my car's in need of some new tires. But we're reminded this morning that God's desire for us never changes. The more we live with God, the longer Jesus' love roots itself in our hearts and less changeable our desire becomes. We will become so filled with generosity, so filled with joy, that all of it will come spilling over the edges of our lives. We may not even notice it. We may not know how a simple decision in the morning like packing a few loaves of bread and fish, may be used by God to bring abundance and healing and hope into our world. But we'll keep living together with each other and with Christ in the hope that tomorrow and the next day we can continue to be God's love in the world. Amen.
Now let us pray the words Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Just like the author of Ephesians, I also pray that the Spirit strengthens your heart and that through your life and your love, the world might experience God's grace. So now receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. Thank you for your support of the ministries of St. Paul Lutheran Church. Our commitment to endeavors that lend hope to other people stretches across the country and around the world. We hope that in a good way, you feel a great part of that reach. So tune in next Thursday for another edition of the St. Paul Podcast.